Professor Huser, what do you see as the crucial components or patterns in pre-Napoleonic thinkers' conceptions of war and victory? The crucial pattern goes back to uh, Aristotle, or definitely to some Roman Republican thinkers, um, and contain the crucial paradox that war can only just be pursued if the aim is peace, a better peace than the situation before the war, and that ideally it should be pursued in a just cause, and the just cause that is the most classic just cause would be self-defense. So there's this crucial linking between war, its just aim, and its just trigger, and the establishment of a better peace, in all of which war must be the lesser evil than the one to live with an unjust condition which is there before the war. And this is something that we find right up to the times of Napoleon from classical antiquity, and we find it renewed to the thinking of the 20th century by the time you get the United Nations and the United Nations Charter and some of the products of the United Nations. So how have these ideas of war and victory, as conceived by early thinkers, continued into the agreed ethics of modern warfare? Several of the conditions of just war, which we already find in classical antiquity, spelled out by people like Cicero in particular, have found their way into a fairly recent report of the United Nations, um, which include the idea that it has to be the last resort, it must be after everything else has been exhausted, that it must be on the basis of a just cause. War can only be justified if the thing that you're fighting over is so major that you can't simply ignore it and that you can't simply find another way of uh, getting to this particular uh, 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 result. That it has to be with the just intention of righting the wrong and not any personal gains. That it has to be pursued with proportionality, not with unnecessary cruelty, not with unnecessary force and it has to be legitimized by a just authority, in this case the United Nations, whereas in antiquity it used to be, or particularly in Christian antiquity, it used to be God, or it used to be um, a, a prince who was standing instead of God. And finally, your lecture centered on a key change in the concept of victory, or the aim of war, in history, which you call the Napoleonic Clausewitzian paradigm. Could you briefly situate this argument in the history of European civilization? The paradigm was clearly born out of the Napoleonic Wars. Several observers found that Napoleon was trying to get, achieve victory for its own sake, but was not very keen on establishing a lasting peace. That's something that he miserably failed to do a number of times over. And people were either impressed by the fact that he was pursuing victory for its own sake, particularly Clausewitz, or simply found that this was the case and that therefore this invalidated many of the things that had been said about the pursuit of peace earlier as a war aim. Uh, I think I date the beginning of the Napoleonic Clausewitzian paradigm with the publication of Clausewitz's on war because he famously and completely amorally talks only about the achievement of military victory and says that everything else does not concern him in his book. And people who read him in the subsequent uh, century and a half honed in on that particular passage and liked it very much and then focused their own thinking exclusively on the achievement of military victory. It went out again, or it began to go out again, this paradigm, uh, with the experience of the First World War, when some thinkers realized that this was somehow inappropriate because victories were not lasting any longer and were not enduring any longer, and they saw that victories actually gave rise to the revanchism that led to the following wars. But it still hadn't completely disappeared in the late 20th century. Time and again, you find that there is a return to the idea of the attempt to achieve military victory for its own sake. You find that in the revival of Clausewitz in the late 20th century under the influence of people like Colonel Harry Summers. Although, at the same time, you get the rise of the UN's attempts to constrain war and to circumscribe war by reapplying the earlier thinking of just war theory that is now important to UN documents and is part of the international order.